Welcome, everybody. Very good. We have a, a very nice turnout. Uh, we're very honored today giving the Sir John Hicks lecture, uh, Tim Kehoe. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about Tim. You all know him, I'm sure. Um, first of all, I went to look at his roots. Uh, roots kind of tell you something about people. Uh, so Tim got his uh, degree at Yale, and uh, you may or may not realize his advisor was Herb Scarf. And uh, the other two people on the committee were uh, Brown and uh, Andreo Moscolo. So that kind of says it all, and I should like sit down now or something. Uh, Tim and I have actually never been on the same faculty at the same time, although we've kind of alternated around. I started at Minnesota, Tim has ended up at Minnesota. Uh, I'm ending up. Uh, for the moment at MIT, and Tim has this experience at MIT, and yeah, I've never talked about this, so maybe I'll provoke you and we can talk a bit about it later. Anyway, if you, uh, if you look at Tim's website, it's totally amazing. Uh, first of all, it's quite good, it's quite organized, everything is there, it's easy to find things, and, and you will see uh, the theory and data part coming through very strongly, which, which reflects uh, his, uh, his training and his experience. Uh, uh, and there are so many papers I could mention, uh, but I will pick out you know, one branch of his work, which is the work with Levine, the Keo Levine uh, <coughs> paper. Actually, there's two of them, I believe, and they're, they're really the, uh, the very first contributions to think about credit markets with default and, and, and quite a seminal contribution. Um, the theory underlies his work, including the empirical work that he does, the, probably from SCARF, the computable general equilibrium and uh, applied general equilibrium work. Uh, I, I think we're going to see uh, some of that today. But the other thing I want to say is about public service. Uh, beyond doing all this research, uh, you will see on Tim's website uh, a couple of things. First of all, uh, not only his work, you know, with his own students, but he gives these amazing lectures uh, at many, many universities in addition to Minnesota. And, uh, and that's really admirable. That's building human capital uh, worldwide. Uh, and the second thing is the optimism, I would say, and dedication to public service with uh, interaction with policy ma makers and governmental and non-governmental units in, in many countries. So it's really almost a campaign of sorts to, uh, to get people to pay attention and to think about the uh, relevance of, uh, of theory and data for public policy. So. Okay, so I don't want to take any more time from Tim. Thank you very much for, for giving us lecture. Wow, after that introduction, anything I do is going to be anticlimactic. Um, uh, thank you very much, Rob. And uh, th thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I love Brazil and, and uh, Rio de Janeiro. Oof, I was talking to the cab driver on the way here. And uh, it's hard to be uh, optimistic about the medium term prospects for Brazil. And that's something, uh, that's something we can talk about. Uh, maybe there's something uh, relevant uh, here for that. Uh, Okay, so what, what is this, what am I going to talk about? And I, 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 the, 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 Rob already helped me with some of my intro. Uh, I'm going to start with identifying uh, something I think that we've uh, come up with as an empirical observation. But as soon as you have an empirical observation, someone like me, I have to build a general equilibrium model. And in this case, it's going to be a dynamic general equilibrium model to try to figure out what's going on in terms of causation. 
Uh, this paper is written with uh, three uh, young economists who are all students at Minnesota at some time in the past. Jose Asturias, who's in uh, Georgetown in uh, Qatar, Sean Herr at the University of Pittsburgh, and Kim Rule, who's in the process of moving from NYU to uh, Penn State. And we're going to say, what drives changes in aggregate productivity? Uh, is it going to be the continuing firms in the economy constantly get better? Or is it going to be what uh, theorists and now some applied people identify as creative destruction, that new firms enter and inefficient old firms drop out? Now, if you just look at the literature, you'll see that some people, and this is going to be very important for our data work, some people cite this seminal paper by Forster, Haltwanger, and uh, Kreisen that says net entry accounts for 25%. This creative destruction, turnover of firms, accounts for 25% of, uh, of productivity growth in the United States. And that's frequent, that's, that paper is frequently cited in the introduction of theory papers. They're going to be all about growth being driven by developments within existing firms. On the other hand, in the development literature, a lot of people cite this paper by Brandt van uh, uh, Biesenbrock e Zhang, which says that net entry accounts for 72% of growth in China. The papers have different time windows. So that accounts for some of the difference. But some of the, some of the difference is going to stay, even when we adjust for that. That paper is cited by people who say creative destruction is everything. We want to kind of resolve this puzzle. I've heard some people say, advanced countries, oh, it's going to be existing firms. Developing countries, it's going to be creative destruction. We're going to think about it in a different way. How does firm entry and exit, I'll often call it net entry, work in accounting for productivity, for productivity growth in periods of slow growth and in periods of rapid growth. We're going to use plant level data. This was, this was kind of good. We have connections in Chile. Sean has good connections in Korea. And we were able to get a, our hands on firm level data, panel data over long periods of time from both countries. And during the periods of time we're looking at, both countries have fast growth periods and slow growth periods. And we're going to also look at, fortunately, this Forster, Haltwanger, uh, Krizan paper is often cited and used for accounting in other studies. Anybody who uses it, the exact same methodology that we do in the literature, we're going to take their results and use those as data points as well. We're going to find out, and we're going to normalize windows, time windows, to five years. You see, as long as firms' expected lifespans are not infinity, if the time window is long enough, net entry is going to be everything. We want to normalize what we mean by a time window. Five years. And we're going to find out that during, during periods of rapid growth, net entry and exit is 42% of productivity growth, on average. During periods of slow growth, it's 23% of growth. So net entry is going to be much more in, uh, important when we're looking at rapid growth. And I'm going to interpret everything in terms of a model. In the long run, I'm in slow growth. We're on a balanced growth path like the United States. We do some kind of reforms, 
we're going to grow fast. And then net entry is going to be the important thing of moving us in the transition from a low balance growth path to a higher balance growth path. We're going to uh, construct a, a model, dynamic uh, general equilibrium model with heterogeneous firms, um, built on the work by uh, Ugo Hoppenheim, who's sitting over there. And then we're going to calibrate it to the U.S. economy. We're going to introduce, in this kind of literature, this is a common trick, you think of the United, those of us who live in the United States realize that the United States is far from being a perfect country. It just in economic terms, in most ways, it's the best. So we're going to think of the United States as being an undistorted economy, and then we're going to introduce distortions to lower the balanced growth path we're on by 20%. And we're going, to reduce, we're going to do that for two things. We're going to reduce it entry costs, and we're going to reduce uh, barriers to technology adoption. And so here I'm thinking of the Parente Prescott paper where they talk about barriers to riches. We're, we're going to introduce a specification like that. And then, in both cases, we're going to see that fast growth is associated with more net entry and exit and more of, given the Forster, Hauptwanger, Krizan decomposition, much more of growth being accounted for by creative destruction. The interesting conclusion is going to be, uh, you know, the econometrician would ask, well, what's the causal mechanism behind the empirical regularity we find? And our answer is it could go either way. Fast growth causes entry and exit, but more freedom of ex entry and exit can cause fast growth. We have to look at other things. To, we have to look at the exact nature of the reforms to figure out which way the, uh, the uh, causality works. So first, data. I know this is an economic uh, theory meeting, but, uh, th th and, and I was really happy that Rob gave me an excuse. Since I'm doing like apply general equilibrium, uh, Herb Scarf style, I get to look at data to motivate what I'm going to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this decomposition of growth due to Foster, Haltwanger, and Kreisen, who are working on uh, Kreisen, excuse me, uh, for the United States. It has five terms in the decomposition. I'm going to lump things together so that I reduce it to two. One is going to be called entry and exit, and the other is going to be, uh, be called growth in continuing firms. I'm going to use that, I'm going to apply that uh, uh, technique to panel data from both Chile and Korea during periods of uh, rapid growth and slow growth. I'm going to have five different time windows. Uh, two for Chile, three for Korea. But to supplement it, I'm going to go to literature and get a bunch more. Okay, let me jump into this quickly. Since this is not uh, an applied econometrics session, this I'm not going to spend that much time in. Crucial thing here is we identify different industries in the data. And what I'm going to assume is that the plants in the same industry have the same production function, although they differ in terms of firm level productivity and so forth. But in terms of the way they combine inputs to get outputs, they're going to have the same functional form. Uh, but across industries, they're different. And I'm going to have order of magnitude uh, uh, 180 industries. Very first day, the, there was a session related to this project, and uh, Jack Rosbach gave a paper I thought is potentially very important, where you use cluster analysis 
looking at firm level data and try to maybe even within industries break things up. Tom Holmes and, uh, and John Stevens have a really nice paper about uh, furniture manufacturing in the United States. It turns out there are some plants that produce mass-produced furniture and other plants that produce uh, uh, very specialized boutique kind of furniture. And they might have different production functions. And that would be interesting to apply here. But I'm not going to do that. OK, and then in industry I, I'm going to try to identify where changes in productivity come from. So, here's what I had just mentioned. The production function for uh, our individual firm in the industry I is going to be a Cobb-Douglas composite of capital, labor, and materials to produce growth, gross output. And there's going to be a firm level uh, productivity. That's that Z. We're going to use Foster, uh, Haltwanger, Krizan. There's other ways that people do this. And we show that, that doing it the other ways don't affect our results. That's in the paper. I'm not going to talk about it. Here's the decomposition. And like I said, each of these, uh, as I said, each of these two terms are in themselves composites of other terms in the five-term decomposition that uh, Foster et al. do. But I'm going to break down changes in productivity at the industry level. Then later, I'll add up industries to get manufacturing. And then I'm going to pretend that the whole economy behaves as manufacturing. There's a few leaps that I'm making in assumptions implicitly to think about overall growth in uh, in, uh, in Korea and Chile, OK? But I'm going to have net entry, what theorists often call, fo following uh, Schumpeter, uh, creative destruction, and just improvements in technology in existing firms. Net entry, we just look at how much more productive, weighted by how much of the uh, market share they have, those are the S's, how much more productive new entrants are than existing firms, and subtracting out how much you gain by having the unproductive firms, that's the second line, who are presumably less productive than the firms who are going to stay in, have them dropping out. The continuing firms we have within firm growth, and then we have redistributional effects by having the market shares of firms change over time. This term sometimes can go wild when you do things in the data and in the model. I'm just going to mention it. It's kind of a covariance term, uh, that reallocation thing. And uh, matching that in the data, we're going to have to do a trick. And, uh, and I'll get to that in a bit. So we're going to, in, in the data, we're going to do productivity changes. We're going to decompose it into just these two rather than the five terms. And then we're going to weight up uh, using the sizes of industries. And then we're going to do something that, unfortunately, in this literature, when, uh, when us kind of mac when we kind of macro guys, I uh, want to talk about the whole economy, and we have good data just on manufacturing. Then we're going to pretend manufacturing is the whole economy. That might be the most, uh, the weakest um, link in our logic, but fortunately, everybody does it, or most people do it, so uh, I'm not going to apologize too much. So, uh, how much does net? Uh, the net entry term account for. 
in the data we have, we can control. It's not always easy to get this plant level data. Here's the windows I'm looking at. And we're talking about two fast growing countries. Although Chile has slowed down faster than uh, what? Yeah, you don't want to grow. Slow down fast, slow, that's a funny thing. Chile has slowed down more than Korea, as we see here. We wanted periods that didn't have business cycle movements in them. And so we broke things up into these five windows. We're working on getting better data from uh, Chile going back farther. Such ex data exists. It's not easy to get your hands on. This we were able to get our, our hands on. So one of our windows here is only going to be um, three, four dots means three years growth. Right? You have a base year and then the three years after that. Uh, so that we're going to adjust so that looks like a five-year window. Here's the data sources. Um, uh, Chile, of course, is a smaller country. Uh, in Chile, we had uh, 177 industries and about uh, five and a half thousand firms. Let me be honest here. These are plants, not firms. And for these countries, we don't really have much information on multi-product firms. Okay, so I'm going to, in my theory stuff, I'm going to keep talking about firms, and I want you to know it means plant. That is just an establishment. Big firms often have multi-establishments. Multi I'm not going to do, uh, do anything about that. And uh, Korea, of course, being a much bigger country, especially in manufacturing, has a lot more plants. Here's something worth looking into, and this is really common in the data. Uh, what happens is they make sure they sample all firms bigger than 10 employees. Our data set doesn't have smaller firms in it, and maybe we want to think about that. But this is a common thing. You, you often find uh, in these uh, uh, the, the industrial um, uh, census, you often find there's a lower limit. Uh, for, 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 for just how small they'll uh, make sure they, they, uh, they go and ask all the questions. In both cases, it's 10, which is common. So here's the result. You notice, monotonically, with the, either the average growth of GDP in general, GDP per working age person, uh, or aggregate uh, um, growth in manufacturing TFP, the higher the growth, the more is accounted for by creative destruction. And you say, what is it? Is it um, entry or exit? I want you to look at this. This would be like Nicholas Caldor when he made up the phrase uh, stylized fact. Right? You all know, you have to always remember what stylized fact means. Nicholas Caldor was my uh, col colleague when I was teaching in Cambridge in the 80s. And he was a brilliant but somewhat difficult to get along with character. Stylized fact in his 1961 paper. He knew what he meant when he said it. It meant, I've studied this for a long time. You are a minor, less intelligent person. Don't dispute me. All right? So it, that, that's a term to be used uh, with care. The stylized fact here is that it's entry that's really important, not the exit. Although they both contribute. Okay? Um, and, once again, stylized fact is it that the new entrants are more productive rather than just increases in the entry rate. 
you'd say, why don't we put in lots more observations? I mean, I can't run, I, I am going to run a regression on this thing in a minute, but I can't run regressions with lots of observations because I don't have a hundred sets of firm level data. It's hard enough to get your hands on one. So we add in additional data points that use the exact same methodology. Some use have different time windows. In particular, that Chinese observation that everybody cites that uh, creative destruction is almost three quarters of Chinese growth, that has a 12 year window. So we use our model to give us a way to transform everything into five year windows. I mean, just very quickly, we compute those three block points using our model. We run a quadratic through it. And then if we find something with a three year window, that's that bl uh, blue square. That's our adjustment. OK? So that's just, uh, that's just a mechanical example that shows how we use the model and this uh, quadratic fit of the model to how much what you uh, 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 account for with net entry and exit by creative destruction uh, at different time windows, we're going to do that adjustment everywhere. So look, slow growth, slow growth we'll call less than 3.5% per year. Those are how much is accounted, the blue numbers are how much is accounted for uh, by net entry and exit by creative destruction. Every single one of those numbers is less than every single one of the numbers in the fast growth uh, observations, which are the red numbers. I don't know. There's a I don't run too many regressions, uh, but there one is. So it shows, um, and it's actually even with the low number of uh, um, even uh, with the low number of observations, it's economically and statistically significant. The faster you grow, the more important net entry and exit is. Okay, model, uh, and those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, Ugo's. Uh, uh, model, this is just an extension of that. Here's the idea, uh, and, and, and thank you for mentioning my, my web page, Rob. I'm even going to check. I have a hit counter, and I'll see how it, it picks up after, after your, your, your nice publicity for me. But the first thing you're going to see if you go to my web page is the economic history of the United States from 1875 to 2015, 140 years, U.S., except for very minor business cycle fluctuations, has been growing at 2% per working age person, real GDP. Of course, there's a big exception, which is the uh, Great Depression and the World War II buildup, and I've spent a lot of time studying that elsewhere. That's not what I'm thinking about here. So, why does the United States grow at 2%? I mean, that was unprecedented when it started. Uh, the UK, well, UK, that's going to be a country that doesn't even exist pretty soon. <laughs> but England, which is where sustained economic growth started, grew at a little bit more than 1% during the 19th century. And then in about 1870, the United States started growing at 2%, and became the, uh, became the richest country in the world. And it still is, I'm not going to talk much, and, 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 and in my way of thinking, I don't spend lots of time thinking about Norway or, or, or Luxembourg. 
Um, and, and when you do the PPP calculations, sometimes they're not even calculated as being that rich. But the U.S. Uh, since around 1900 has been the richest major country in the world. Why does the U.S. grow at 2%? I'm going to take that as given. I don't know. Uh, Robert Lucas spends a lot of time thinking about that. I admire him. He's, a, he's at a different level than me, so I'll, I'll just leave him. And, and when he sorts it out, I'll be really happy. But, I, but as, as, as Rob mentioned, I travel a, uh, around a lot, especially in Latin America and, and Spain and so forth, and, and talk to economists there. And I say, we don't need to be worried about why the U.S. grows at 2%. They do. Uh, we should be worried why we're not growing faster than 2% to catch up. So that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about here. Uh, the economic frontier moves out over time by a factor, GE, which you're not going to be surprised to see when I put numbers to this, is 1.02. Why is it 1.02? I don't know, but it is. Existing firms are going to grow slower than that. Why? Because that's what my data tells me. Uh, and I'm going to focus on the endogenous entry and exit of firms. We're going to develop a very tractable uh, uh, balanced growth path for this model. Um, the transition dynamics are much more complicated, and that's all on the computer. So I have to come out and say this. Why don't we have an endogenous growth model here? In the early 1990s, I worked a lot on endogenous growth models. If I was teaching a history of economic thought course, I'd talk about endogenous growth. OK? That's the nicest thing I can say about endogenous growth. <laughs> I, I swore it off. I, I, so when people ask me about growth effects versus level effects, my way of thinking about economic growth, everything's level effects. Except for that move from English economic growth, well, pre-industrial revolution, if we believe Gregory Clark, zero growth, then 1%, now 2%, yeah. Maybe that's endogenous, but that, as I already mentioned, is beyond me. And it's been constant in the United States for 140 years. And we've had tons of changes in policies, and it hasn't changed. That's the best I can say. Is China going to overtake the United States? No time soon. Some of you, I'm looking around. We tend to be sitting right here, are uh, old enough to remember, or, or maybe Ugo, are uh, old enough to remember uh, how, how concerned Americans were about Japan overtaking us in the 1980s. They got to, uh, according to the, the, the uh, uh, PPP numbers, um, they got to about 85, 90% of the United States in around 1990, and then they stalled out. No other advanced country's even gotten that close since. Okay? Balanced growth is going to depend only on GE, not on GC. Uh, and, but the level is going to be determined by all kinds of things we could put in the model. And we could put taxes in the model. We could, all of these kind of things determine the level you're at. Uh, and this is very comp uh, compatible with Douglas North's way of looking at economic uh, development is depending on institutions. To the extent we can quantify those, they would fit into this model. They're, they all determine levels. But when you do a reform, 
you change the institutions, you change the policies, to the extent to which they would move you to another balanced growth path, you have very rapid growth for a while as you adjust, okay? Consumers here are going to be very, very simple. Um, there is something important here, though. Uh, I'm going to look at a closed economy model. To the extent to which you're, to the extent to which you're open, adjustments can be sp sped up. And so that's going to be worth uh, thinking about here. One of the things that's going to slow down your adjustment is we're going to see to get a whole new set of firms we're going to have heterogeneous firms. To get a whole new set of firms, you're going to need to do lots of this creative destruction. Get rid of the old firms, bring in new ones. Where does all that investment come from? It's going to come from the consumers. So in the transition across growth paths, we're going to get interest rates going going up because firms are going to be borrowing from consumers to do all this creative destruction. To the extent to which we could borrow from abroad, it makes the transition less painful. Okay, so that, 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 that's some, somewhere we, that we should, something we should work on. Here all the uh, consumers are doing is eating and decide how much to save and in equilibrium, what they save has to be equal to what the firms are borrowing. Uh, and the interest rate's going to be the mechanism that, uh, or the instrument that, that does that for you. The model is based on uh, Ugo Hoppenheim. Um, and I've already mentioned, a firm in the model uh, is a plant in the data. Multi-product firms are interesting given the limitations in our data sets, and our data set and a lot of the data sets we refer to in the literature, we're not going to worry about that. Firms are going to pay a fixed cost to enter, and uh, that's going to be one of the things I move around. They also have to pay a smaller fixed cost over time to stay in the model. That's what leads to exogenous exit. At some point, it's no longer profitable to pay that uh, we have to investigate that more. I can see, show you results about what happens when F changes, the continuation cost, but I'm not going to worry about it that much. To get, um, to get firms to exit enough, and this is common in the literature too, that just the endogenous exit, uh, given I'm not having idiosyncratic shocks to firms. This is not an overall stochastic model. Uh, I, I have to uh, impose some of it exogenously. So I'm going to have an exogenous death. What you could think of this, though, is that there's just, the, there is idiosyncratic shocks to productivity. Um, the normal state is you just keep growing as all the other firms are. And I'll get back to it. That's that GC parameter. But every once in a while, something goes really wrong. Because in the data, some big firms drop out. And so I need something to do it. So there's going to be a little, th this delta is in the background. It, this is not theoretically important. It's only going to be important to match the data. Here's how I think of the, the, the kappa. Uh, there's a kappa T, which is techno technologically what you need to do to set up the plant. You know what I mean? You, 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 you buy a building and you install some machinery. That's what you need to get going. That's going to be investment, and then the accumulated stock of that investment is going to be the capital stock in the model. So this is like, if we think of that putty-clay distinction, from the growth literature in the 50s and 60s. This is just capital's fixed proportions here. Okay? Not fixed, but it's just fixed. But some of it is imposed by the government. Or by, whew, I don't know, this is kind of, 
better be careful what I say here in Brazil, or some of it's corruption. That's what the taxi driver was telling me is the problem in Brazil this morning. So could, but that's that Tao term. Where could you measure it? Well, you know, the World Bank has this project doing business, tries to measure stuff like that. Ministers of uh, economics or finance in countries that don't rank high keep pressuring the World Bank to shut that program down. That must mean it's really good. I don't think the data is that great, but it's good there's the project. So that's Tau. To have the balanced growth path, and, and, and I'm thinking the, that kappa has to grow over time. Um, but it's not just for that reason. It, 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 it's, I think that makes more sense. You have to sacrifice some of your output, and as you have more and more output uh, per person, or maybe you have to pay somebody, and as wages grow, uh, go up, that cost goes up because you're paying the, the people, the lawyers, accountants, whatever, who are helping set up your firm, it gets more expensive. So that's going to grow over time. Um, the firms, the model in some sense is simple. Uh, the firms have this dynamic entry-exit decision, and then every period they just maximize profits. This model you can use, and in the, the session on uh, yesterday, in the, in the morning, we used this with a Mellet's kind of framework that is a combination of Hoppenheim with uh, Dixit Stiglitz. Uh, and you, that's good for thinking about international trade. Since measurement of productivity is very problematical there, uh, that's not what we're doing. This is perfect competition. It's going to be like uh, Ugo's original paper. Uh, the uh, profit maximization here is very easy. That's a static decision that you can separate from the exit, uh, entry exit decision. Okay, you just, we're going to only have labor here in the data we're going to have capital. Um, for us, capital is going to be the plant and the continuation cost. Okay? Uh, we could put in fungible capital in the model. The model's going to be complicated without it. I don't see what it's going to add at this point. You notice here, X is going to be the firm level uh, efficiency that's going to be very closely related to the, what we call the productivity, the Z in the data, but not identical. Uh, that is what you take the drawer of uh, on at the very beginning. And the better you are, the bigger you're going to be. Firms that are already in the model, the only decision that they're going to uh, take is to exit or not. And they're going to grow over time at this rate, GC. OK? You see, because they have productivity x at the draw, and then afterwards, they have x multiplied by gc. And they might die ex ex exogenously. That's delta. gc. Theor if, if I was being a pure theorist, I would not do this. But it's to get that. I, I showed you that covariance term. It's to get that to not go crazy. I have to do something like this. That when overall growth picks up, GC picks up as well. And we're just going to call that a spillover from the more productive new entrants is going to spill over into productivity of existing firms. In terms of the theory, totally unnecessary. In terms of getting our numbers to work, it's necessary. Uh, and that, um, that epsilon term, we're going to estimate it looking at the data. 
because it turns out in the fast growth episodes, not just you get more and more productive new firms, the existing firms, their growth speeds up. I'm not going to have that be endogenous. I'm going to have it be exogenous. I'm going to call it a spillover. And you're going to say, well, wait a minute, Tim. You're going to have a productivity distribution that's shifting to the right, but how can new entrants get more productive except for that GE term? It's because when you're in one of these periods of creative destruction, people try to enter. They go crazy paying that capital, uh, uh, capital to try to uh, enter. And you get the endogenous limits on who does enter shifting to the right as well. So you go through a period where, not you, where you're taking more and more draws, and that means the ones you end up with are much more productive. That's the mechanism here. OK, so here it is in equations. Look at that thing I have on the top. Um, that's a Pareto distribution. And that's constantly shifting by this factor uh, GE. Why? Because all we're doing in this country is imitating the frontier countries. It's the United States, but in some industries, it's, uh, it's Germany. In some industries, it's uh, Japan. You look at this, uh, uh, this book by this guy, Bill Lewis, who was a, a consultant for McKinsey for years. And then they set up uh, McKinsey Global Institute, where he did case studies across different countries. The book is called The Power of Productivity, because he says everything's productivity. And it's interesting that a non-economist could come to the same conclusion that people like uh, uh, Parente and Prescott came to. Because his stuff is words that could accompany Parente Prescott. He got a lot of advice from people at the, some kind of institutions of higher learning in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And they'd never mentioned uh, Kidlin and Prescott, I mean, uh, excuse me, Parente Prescott to him. So he didn't realize that that's exactly what he was doing. But um, that's that fee term here. There's some vested interests in the country that are keeping you away from the frontier. OK, that's, uh, that's V. And the mass of potential, uh, uh, of potential uh, entrance is determined by this costly entry condition. Can I do a crusade for a minute? Economists call this a free entry condition. Let's stop doing it. It's, no, come on. Kappa is a cost. Nothing free. And the, one of the essential things here is I can move kappa around. If kappa goes down, entries more profitable, more guys pay to try to start up a firm, more guys fail. But the set of entrants gets better. That's what's going on in the model. And there's a crucial cutoff here, uh, x hat, that says, Wow, it's great to be a successful entrepreneur. Keep taking drawers. And when you finally get more than X hat, you're set. And you're going to make a lot of, uh, make a lot of profits. Of course, in equilibrium, the profits made by the successful firms are going to balance the losses of the people who pay to take drawers and don't end up operating. It's like. Anybody been to Mexico City recently? I'm in the middle of spending the year in, 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 in Mexico City. Uh, it's vacation, that's why I'm here. What's going on there? There's a revolution uh, in the food industry taking place. It's an exciting place to be. In the, in the neighborhood I live in, La Condesa, uh, there's new restaurants starting every week. They're paying the kappa. There's 
month old restaurants going out of business every week. Yeah, because they, they weren't good enough. But you know what? The ones that survive are better. That's what's essential here. I, was, uh, I spent a lot of time in, in Barcelona in the 1990s where the same thing happened. It's tremendous. Any of you guys spend any time in Italy? They haven't gone through that process. Italian food 30 years ago seemed pretty good. It's not anymore. I mean, yeah, it's better. It's better than it was 30 years ago, but they didn't go through the revolution of taking it up to another level. Re lesson, no reason to go to Italy. Go to Spain or, or even Mexico, okay? Yeah, well. So far, so good. <laughs> exactly. But I think Brazil's doing better too, but they need more of this revolution, huh? It's like when I talk to young people in Mexico, they want to be chefs. Just like here, you'd want to be an entrepreneur. Okay, so we, we do the accounting here. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this. There's a lot of former students of mine here. I know on the problem sets, you spend all the time with dynamic general equilibrium models learning how to correctly define an equilibrium for your model. I remember Neil Wallace, when I showed up at MIT, MIT at Minnesota, poof, left MIT, and he, was, he wanted to really say a student didn't know what was going on. He'd say, that guy, woman, doesn't even know how to define equilibrium correctly in their own model. In Minnesota, that's the worst insult. But you can believe me that I know how to do it. So I'll, I'll just skip through this. The economy is going to converge to a balanced growth path uh, in which everything's determined by uh, GE, and the mass of potential entrants and operating firms is going to be constant. Here is an analytical characterization of the balanced growth path. Like I say, you get really easy formulas for this. Um, when we do comparative statics, we see things like change the entry cost, kappa. And the mechanism is, as I've just outlined, more productive, uh, uh, more potential entrants, pay to draw efficiencies, that drives up the, the firms that end up operating. You know, more people try and more people fail. But that's, that's like Schumpeter's creative destruction. It's tremendous. The chef that tries and fails is just as important for progress as the, as, as the guy who gets the good draw. Overall wages output increase above and beyond the 2%. Lower fee does a very similar kind of thing, except we don't have more potential entrants. See, the entrants themselves are more productive without having to try harder. So that, that's the essential difference between these two. We haven't looked that much at changing the operating cost. Turns out that doesn't drive up productivity, it just drives up investment. That's not what we see in the data, and we have to stress this more. The data tells us that growth and productivity grow to go together. And this is something that gives you more output just because you have more investment. Okay, I've already outlined this, and I want to finish up. Um, so that we're going to look at two economies. We, we got the United States as our reference economy, uh, and then we have two economies that are below it. One's below it because it has uh, high entry costs, and the other's below it because barriers to riches, a la Parente Prescott. We're going to remove the distortion and we're going to look at the transition to the new growth path. 
Uh, I'm not going to go into the details on this. Uh, they're in the paper. Kappa and F, the entry cost and, and, uh, and continuation cost, that's investment. Depreciation is going to be the losing the capital of the firms that die, the kappa that's paid to enter if it doesn't get utilized, and then we're going to have some kind of uh, accounting for F. Because we are going to want to do national income accounting here. We're going to convert everything into a measure that coincides with what... Uh, remember that that's a fundamental rule. When you have a model, you put in a statistician that does the same things to the results of, of, your, of, your, of your model as the statisticians do in the data. And so we do that carefully. Let me not go through the details. We are going to calibrate the model to match the United States in terms of size distribution of plants, uh, the effect of continuing firms on aggregate productivity growth. Remember, it's 75% uh, for the United States, and the employment uh, share of exiting firms, as well as various macroeconomic targets. We're going to estimate the spillover to match stuff in the data. So here's the picture. And anyone who's interested in the overall project, go to my website. I got a couple blah blah, but nice blah blah, papers on stages of economic growth re revisited, uh, where I even have pictures where this is. Uh, Mexico and, uh, Mexico, excuse me, where this is United States and Japan. Japan catching up for a while and then leveling off. Here I'm going to have the reforms taking the country up to the United States. But we're going to have this transition period. A model period here is going to be five years. So the transition is going to take about three periods, about 15 years of rapid growth. And what happens? We reduce entry costs. A lot more potential uh, entrants. Efficiency uh, thresholds go up. So you, you try more, and the guys who survive are better. Uh, but in the long run, we're going to end up with the same number of firms. Wages are going to go up, output's going to go up. Fast growth. So we're going to take, we're going to take, uh, oh, here we're saying 20 years, uh, because four model periods, uh, we're, we're reducing entry costs. We're going to see that growth goes from 2% to about 5%. Contribution that's due to net entry is going to go to 68%. Not bad. We do the same thing with technology adoption. Turns out we get, we've rigged it to get the exact same numbers. So what's the, what's the conclusion here? Uh, or maybe if I, I was an econometrician, I'd be driven crazy by this paper. Cause effect can go either way. You lower kappa, and, and, uh, and, 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 and there's international agencies that push this. They say, the only way you can grow is show up better in that doing business. Lower your entry costs. That'll give you growth. That's true. But do anything else that causes growth, like lowering the fee, the barriers to technology adoption of uh, Parente Prescott, that causes entry and exit. Entry and exit are essential to growth. But what's exactly doing it depends on the reform. There's a lot more to do. 
But that makes me excited, because I don't want to finish this project. It's a lot of fun. Thank you for letting me share the results so far with you.